Well, shalom and uh, good morning to uh, to our new our second study of the Torah portion of, of Noah, Parashat Noah, or Noah in Hebrew, Genesis 6 to 11. And we're picking it up of the story of where Noah and his family leave the ark. So we've now got a new world. The Bible is explaining to us how the world that we see right now came to be. And a lot of the story, remember, uh, the the the, the, the scrolls that you would see behind me uh, are read to the people. So the people actually hear the Bible more than they actually read the Bible. So the way things sound are going to be incredibly important to the story. So let's read, picking it up from Genesis 9, verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank the wine, and he was drunk, and he became uncovered in his tent. And Ham... The father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backwards, covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done to him. And then he said, Cursed be Canaan, servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And may God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Noah lived after the flood 350 years, so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and then he died. So a couple of interesting things that, that point out why is this story even there out of all of the stories of creation with floods and building of Babel and the expansion around the world, etc. Why do you have to talk about this? So uh, let's have a look again at the text. The sons of Noah went out and you get the three names of, the, of Noah. Noah has children. They are Shem. Ham and Japheth. And then it interestingly says, and Ham was the father of Canaan. What does the text not say? It doesn't give the names of any of the other's children. Why not? Maybe they didn't have some, but you're hearing something. Every time you hear the word Ham, you're going to hear that he's the father of Canaan. Every single time. Now the sons of Noah went out from the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. So we can all trace our lineage back to, to Noah. Yes, we can all go back to Adam, but that generation all gets wiped out. And now you have uh, the pure man, because Noah was righteous and pure, and, and, the, and the, the universe traces its, its origin to that gene pool. It's very interesting. Not to the original gene pool. Like we call ourselves sons of Adam. But by the time you get to Noah, you now have a slightly different gene pool. Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Okay, so you get some, some uh, uh, a statement of his craft. Okay, what is he not? He's not uh, a, a, a herdsman like Abel, he's agrarian like Cain. Right. Remember in the story, the story of Cain and Abel, it wasn't the fact that Cain brought grain. It was the fact that Cain's heart was wrong, not the actual um, product that he bought. Because in, in this, in, eventually in Leviticus, we're going to discover that animals and grain are of the same weight. You don't have enough money to be a herdsman and you can't bring to the Lord a goat. That's OK. You can bring bring grain. God does not dismiss the poor. So uh, he plants a vineyard, 
and he gets drunk from the wine. Now, this takes time. Again, as you go through the text in Genesis, there's always time. Nothing ever seems to happen immediately. When God wants to drain the water, it doesn't happen immediately. It takes time. And again, the story has this large amount of time in it. How long did it take him to cultivate the land? How long did it take him to actually plant the vineyard? How long did he have to have to wait? What did he do in the meantime? None of that is there. The story just, just goes from point to point to point. A bit like Mark's gospel, really. But here you've got a vineyard, and then you've got wine, and then you've got uh, drunkenness. And he becomes uncovered. What actually that means? Does it just mean that he's naked? Has he never been naked before in his life? Why are the children uh, so shocked with this? Um, parts of the story perhaps might not be as clear as, 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 as we, we might like to, to think. Ham, the father of Canaan, remember, every time you hear the word Cain, uh, Ham, he's always, his children are always mentioned. One child is actually mentioned. Uh, he sees his father the nakedness of his father, and he tells his two brothers. What does that phrase in Hebrew mean? To uncover someone's nakedness, I hear you ask. Good question. On a literal English level, we might just say, um, well, he saw his father naked, and that's it. However, in Leviticus 18, Leviticus 18 lists a series of um inappropriate sexual relationships and it describes them as uncovering your nakedness so the phrase when you hear it uncovering your nakedness means an inappropriate sexual relationship and so what does ham see it says he saw something he saw an inappropriate relationship now, what does that mean? When you go to Leviticus, it could mean an inappropriate relationship with a person, or it could mean an inappropriate relationship with a person's wife. So it's not 100% clear from the text what's going on. But here says something interesting. Okay. Shem and, Shem and Yafet take a garment and, and, and walk backwards, and they make sure that they don't see anything. They don't under, know what's going on. They cover their father. Everything is... Um, uh, for them, is honourable. It says in uh, in verse twenty four, Noah awoke, and he knew what his young son had done to him. Or uh, in Hebrew, it says, "Ve'yaketz Noach," and Noah awoke, arose, miyainu um, from his wine. Uh, et asha asa, and he knew something that was done lo, asa lo, that was done to him, benohakatan, from the young son. What doesn't it say? It doesn't say the word ham. It uses the word benohakatan, the young son. Who's the young son? Notice the order of children: Shem, Ham, and Yafet. Who's the youngest of those three? Okay. Correct. It's Yafet. It's not Ham. So often, we often think it's Ham. He's done something wrong. He's done something wrong. Actually, the young son has done something wrong. Who is the young son? I hear you ask. Good question. The unnamed young son. Well, I've actually been naming the young son uh, throughout the text so far. And it's the, it's the child of Ham. Because notice what Noah does. Noah awoke understands something's been done inappropriately and proceeds to curse. And what does he say? Cursed be Canaan. He doesn't say cursed be Ham. All right? That's not there. So cursed, if, if Ham is the guilty party, you would have used his, his, his name. You, you know his name. We've used his name throughout the text. So far in the scroll, there's nothing untoward with his name. We know it. Uh, but instead, here it's not Ham. It's cursed be Canaan. He is going to now be a servant of servants. That's his curse. He's now going to his status will now be incredibly lowly. Something was inappropriate. Something was horrible, and his curse is now going to be generational. It's going to affect the generations. Hence, this, by the way, is the first sin of the new world. Okay, what happened in the in the old world 
the uh, antediluvian, the, the pre-flood, uh, is it had grown up in, in immorality and violence and the Lord said, okay, that's enough. Impurity and immorality are rife and you get the flood. And now sin starts again. And what's the first sin? It's immorality again. And so, and who do, who who starts the first sin on the new world? Canaan. And in Jewish tradition, in exegetical tradition, beginnings and ends are constantly um, in play. They're beginning in the same way. They're ending in the same way, often in the same day, with the same people, uh, in the same pattern. Where does God take his people into a land to be the light to the nations and to correct everything? The land of Canaan, right? And so you begin to see something much bigger than, than just a, a, a story of what happens when we come off the ark. The first sin on the planet of the new world is through Canaan. And it's going to be where God is going to bring his people. It's going to take them into Canaan. And Canaan uh, will be a servant. It's not the only part of the, of the curse. There's actually some blessings as well. And uh, Noah goes on to say, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, what does he, not the God of who? Ham, Ham or Yafet. Interestingly, I mean, you would think that Noah would, would have been teaching his kids, there's only one God. You mean that whole big flood thing, you know, the, the big destruction that's happened? That's from the Lord. But here you get Shem is going to be guarding the truth. Shem is going to uh, hold on to to um, the, the the promises, and so in Jewish tradition, exegetical tradition, who is Melchizedek, priest of of Mo, of God Most High, is Shem. According to Jewish tradition, Melchizedek is Shem. Okay, um, you don't have to believe that or agree with it, but that is the Jewish tradition, if you if you want. Uh, and and Canaan will serve him. Okay, and also then Yafet is going to be enlarged. He's going to expand his territory. It's going to be beautiful for him. And again, Canaan will be will be his his servant. So, the first sin, Canaan, the correction in the land of Canaan, will be done by the people of Israel. The rest of the Torah portion has a couple of interesting points. In chapter ten, you get the the table of nations. That's what sometimes it's given a title, although there are no titles in the original text. It's a list of seventy names. So from the descendants of Noah, you get 70 uh, new names. And this sets up the tradition that there are 70 nations in the world. All nations of the world can link themselves to the to these 70. Uh, and in Sukkot, at this, uh, at this time, uh, you often offer 70 bulls as sacrifices, one for each nation. Israel has always meant to be a light to the nations, to speak to the nations, and if the nations aren't even listening, to sacrifice on the behalf of the nations. Now, is that actually possible? Can we do that? You do see Job offering sacrifices on the behalf of his son. What do we do? We pray for our children. Oh, I hope we do. We offer prayers and intercessions on behalf of others, and so we should. And, uh, and, it's, and, it, and it sits up there right at uh, the beginning of time. So there are 70 nations. The world is traced to these. And then as we go... These these nations, well, they don't do so well. They uh, in verse in chapter eleven, which is going to end the Torah portion, we discover that the whole earth has one language and one speech. What is that language? I hear you ask. Don't know. Okay, it doesn't say we were all speaking Hebrew. Okay, as much as people would probably love that to be the case, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't say that. Um, but however, this this group of of people travel east. And they come to a place called the land of Shinar. Uh, when you hear the word Shinar, does that actually mean anything to anybody? Fair enough. It's uh, where uh, uh, they take Daniel captive, Babylon. Babylon is on the plains of Shinar. And what do they do on the plains of Shinar? They build the table, the tower of Babel. And that's actually the connection of, of uh, the name. So what do these humans do? They, uh, they come and settle. They go east. They go settle. And they build a tower. And, uh, and this tower is an interesting. Why build a tower? The text says because we want to build a name for ourselves. 
But a group of people who are settling in one place are actually doing the opposite of what God said. God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Instead of filling the earth, we're just going to locate into one place. And it's um, uh, not, not, not appropriate. The Bible actually has, well, the Hebrew Bible has um, uh, largely, not all, but largely negative things to say about cities. Okay? Cities tend to be places where humans get together and they do not very nice stuff. But there are good cities like Jerusalem and things like that. And uh, many heroes go and found cities and build cities. But um, the first time you get a congregation of people in one place, it's in the negative context. And instead of filling the earth, they're doing the opposite of what God says. There's a potential that he might... Um, uh, flood the world again, even though he made a covenant saying he would not do that. Then, so what do you do? Build up. Try to build higher than the previous uh, previous thing. What does God do? In verse 5 of chapter 11, it says, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Now, this uh, sets up an interesting thought. Why does God have to come down and see? Surely he could see it from heaven but what this brings in is an interesting idea that when god enters the universe that is is inside the universe inside creation he is also then subject to its rules like jesus jesus was subject to the rules of creation he was subject to gravity he had to eat. He had to breathe. He had to go to the bathroom. Okay, All those things we don't like usually thinking that the Lord did. And so in Jewish tradition, when they see texts like this, they just go in, in ex Jewish exegesis. They just say, look, when the Lord is, is, is in the universe, he looks, he sees, he talks. He can be in our location like Mount Sinai. And if he's sitting on Mount Sinai, where is he not? He's not on the beaches of Australia. He's at Mount Sinai. So they have a, they have a, a where God has a tradition of being able to limit himself. Hence, it should be, not, shouldn't come as a surprise to us that God emptied himself or Jesus emptied himself and took the form of a, of a human. It's a, it's a Jewish thing that, that he can actually do that. So then uh, we notice that the Lord disperses the people by, by creating multiple languages. And so this Torah portion sets up the, uh, how the world got to be the way it was after the flood, the cataclysm that we see uh, around, the, around the world. All the different uh, nations are created and all the different languages are, are given. And then the Torah portion ends with in the, in chapter 11 beginning at verse 27 with the family of Avram who is going to become the major character in next week's Torah portion and it starts off with his own genealogy chapter of uh, chapter 11 verse 27 this is the genealogy of Terah Terah begot Avram Nahor and Haran Haran begot Lot Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldees. So these are Chaldeans, and we know where they're from. They're from Ur. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Avram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of um, Iscah. But Sarah was barren and she didn't have any children. So you can see that there's um, that, that marrying within the family and the clan. They're keeping the genealogy tight. Terah took his son Avram and his grandson Lot, the son of Aram, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his, son's, his son Avram's wife. And they went out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and they dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in her own. So a couple of things that end the Torah portion, which are completely blank. And let's ask some questions. What's a good question of the text? Who told Terah to go to Canaan? 
next week's Torah portion, it's going to be God speaks to Avram. But it appears they're already on the way. Now, isn't that interesting? It seems that there is there are two traditions of how Avram gets to, to Canaan. One, his father is already on the journey. And the other is going to be, um, it actually is a direct call to Avram, which will be next week's Torah portion. But the text here, the little bit of that we have in the Bible, these short few verses, it doesn't explain why Terah is making the journey. It doesn't explain uh, why he does not take Nahor, why he leaves part of the family back in the land. And we're going to come back to this family again when we need to go and um, and uh, uh, find a wife for Isaac. Because <clears throat> we want to keep things within the family. We want to keep the genealogy genealogy uh, tight. Uh, and it doesn't explain what's so good about Haram that allows us to sojourn there and stay there. Um, Haran today is in Turkey, right next to the Syrian border. Um, and uh, what's interesting about um, about the, the the modern city of Haran, no one knows how they got there. It's full of Arabs. The rest of the the the, 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 the cities around Haran, modern day Haran, are all Turkish, and yet in the middle of Haran, it's almost entirely Arabic. Um, ask how they got there. No one knows. <laughs> okay, but um, but I, I do know some people who have actually been to Haran and uh, and and can attest to 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 what they what they saw. We have no. The text is blank. So what happens is you end up with some very very interesting midrashim. What's a midrash? I hear you ask. It's a story that's not true, but it tells a truth. And so you read in the text, Haran died before his father. Doesn't tell you how, doesn't tell you why. So they have a really cool story about um, Terra being an idol maker. He makes idols. And as his idol shop is burning down, Haran runs into the house to try and save some of the idols, but catches fire himself and dies in front of his father. And so they take the text and they make a literal story. Is it true? It's a midrash. Okay, they're just trying to to create stories about about why. Um, why does Hara, why does Terra leave Chaldea? We don't know. Why does he not get all the way to Canaan? We don't know. So Jewish exegesis is going to sit and try and explain some of those things. But we will pick up those that part of the story next uh, next week with uh, with Avram. So a lot in the first 11 chapters. The world has been recreated. The world has fallen back into sin. And the first sin came from Canaan. And where is God's people going to be to fix the problem? It will be in the land of Canaan.